Hello, everyone. So I'm going to start by welcoming you all back once again and telling you that I'm Cleo from Winchester Skeptics. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our very first talk of 2024 here at Skeptics in the Pub online. We're kicking off the year in good style. We've got a real treat in store for you today. But first, a few announcements. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we came together when we couldn't put on our local talks at the start of the first lockdown. We now hold them here every fourth Thursday. Over the years, we've had speakers from a really wide variety of disciplines, from physics to philosophy and from history to psychology and everything in between. But what our speakers all have in common is that they approach their subject from an evidence-based point of view. As usual, we have a chat running, which you can contribute to if you're signed in, and our moderators will be putting things in the chat from time to time, such as where to find our speakers' books. If you're chatting, don't forget to stay civil, and if you disagree with anyone, please be nice. After our talk tonight, we'll have a 15 minute break. Then we'll go into our Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, for our speaker about his talk, go to sitp.online forward slash ask to post them. You can also upload other questions that you'd like to hear the answer to. If you'd like to support our running costs, you can do so via sitp.online forward slash support. If you want to contribute on a regular basis, we have a Patreon page. Skeptics in the Pub Online, all one word, no spaces. There are four levels of donation you can choose from, and in return, you get to watch all our broadcasts and our YouTubes uh, with a warm glow of satisfaction, because you know you've contributed. Oh, and that glow is guaranteed to get increasingly warm with each level of contribution that you increase. And we know that you're far too sophisticated an audience to want anything more than that. So, on to the main event. Tonight, we're really proud to be able to present Professor Jim Al-Khalili, who will be talking to us about Does Life Know About Quantum Mechanics? I'm particularly keen to hear him speak on this, as his book about quantum biology, Life on the Edge, was one of the best I read last year. And he's told us that more has been learned on the subject since then. So you can see why I'm really excited about it. Jim holds the Distinguished Chair of Theoretical Physics at Surrey University where his research is into quantum mechanics. He's a CBE and a member of the Royal Society and is published widely, mainly books which make physics more accessible to the lay reader, including Life on the Edge and his most recent book, The Joy of Science. He's also published fiction, a book called Sunfall, which I can highly recommend as I thought it was excellent. Perhaps he's most widely known in this country as a TV and radio broadcaster, most notably possibly for his weekly Radio 4 programme, The Life Scientific. So can I ask you to fill the chat with clapping emojis and give a really warm welcome to Professor Jim Al-Khalili. Thank you very much, Cleo. Well, hello everyone and, and good evening. Pleasure to be here, pleasure to be, be kicking off the Skeptics of the Pub Online first talk of, of 2024. Um, it's always a with the new year, as I'm sure you all do the same thing, when you're sending emails, you, you wonder at what point in January do we stop saying Happy New Year? I I, I tend to, after two weeks, uh, evolve to, I hope the new year is treating you well so far or something like that. But anyway, we're in the, the end of January now, so I won't even bother saying it. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about um, a new interdisciplinary area of research. I've been involved in, as Claire mentioned in the introduction, I wrote a book on this subject. I'll say something about that. But also I'm very actively uh, involved in, in, in research in this new field. Uh, so the, the talk is, um, so the first half of the talk is going to be sort of quite broad and, and uh, um, I hope easy to follow. The second half, I'm going to get into a little bit of technical detail, which I hope... Uh, uh, those of you with the appropriate background will be able to follow, but hopefully I won't lose lose anyone entirely. Um, OK, so why uh, does life know about quantum mechanics? So this is about a new area of research called quantum biology. Um, if you think back to school days, uh, science tends to, tends to be siloed into physics, chemistry, biology. If you go and study science at university, then very often you can work on topics which are the interface, biochemistry, physical biology, physical chemistry, and so on. Quantum biology, I would argue, sits somewhere in the middle of this Venn diagram because it's about 
a, a, a quantum physics understanding of the processes of life, molecular biology, which ultimately comes down to chemistry <laughs> in the end. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about why the subject is controversial to some extent still, why it's still speculative, but also why it's exciting and potentially uh, uh, very important. Um, OK, so let's start basics. Uh, if you think about um, uh, length scales, uh, objects in our everyday experience like tennis balls, we able, we're able to describe their, their dynamics using what we call Newtonian mechanics the classical mechanics that we learn at school, kinetic energy, potential energy, momentum, angular momentum, forces, masses, and so on. Um, and it does very well. Newtonian mechanics uh, is, is very accurate for the sorts of objects of the scale of a tennis ball or indeed a planet. Um, but as we get smaller in size, drop down in, in powers of 10, uh, I've deliberately included here uh, um, objects from uh, uh, you know, living, uh, living systems. So you know, down to a cancer cell, to a bacteria, a virus, all the way down to the, the building blocks of life, DNA. And I mentioned DNA because I'm going to say something about our research uh, on that uh, later on. My background, uh, except my PhD in the first at least two, two and a half decades of my, my research academic career have been in nuclear physics. And so atoms are huge for nuclear physicists. Uh, I'm sure you 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 know that 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 um, cartoon of an atom there at ten to the minus ten meters uh, isn't uh, indicative of what atoms look like. In any case, the nucleus is something like a hundred thousand times smaller than atoms. So this is not done to scale. So th the atomic nucleus is the playground of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the theory that has to replace classical mechanics when we go down small enough. Uh, we realize that Newton's uh, uh, equations, Newton's laws uh, of motion, none of these things work when we try to de describe the dynamics, the behavior, the properties of atoms and the particles that make up atoms. But I've highlighted this uh, 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 the, the nanometer scale, 10 to the minus nine, one billion of a meter, as being the boundary between what can be described, this, something that's big enough to be described using classical Newtonian mechanics and things that are too small and have to be described by quantum mechanics. And as it happens, um, structures like DNA, um, large molecules, sit on that boundary. Uh, the question is then, should we be using quantum mechanics to describe some of their behavior? Quantum mechanics, as far as physicists and chemists have been concerned, uh, are concerned, has been tremendously uh, successful in helping us describe the building blocks of, of our world. Uh, this is a, a, a famous uh, diagram of the what's called the standard model of particle physics, the, the elementary particles that make up all matter. Uh, in fact, uh, the left-hand column, as you look at it, you know, so the, the, the yellow balls are the quarks, and there are six different types of quarks, but the, the first column uh, uh, has the up quark, the down quark, the neutrino, and the electron. Essentially, those particles, well, in fact, forget the neutrino. I always, I always say this and, and uh, uh, upset people who work in neutrino physics, but I say neutrinos really, they don't, they don't, no one cares about them. Everything, we know everything's made of atoms and all atoms are made of these three particles, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. <coughs> but of course, there are also particles that carry the, the different forces of nature, the, the photon, the carrier of the electromagnetic force, the gluon, the, the W and Z bosons, and of course, the famous Higgs boson. This is pretty much everything, or everything in, 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 uh, that makes up normal matter in our universe is made of these particles. <laughs> it may be that um, things like dark matter, uh, which is stuff that's out there in the universe, may be made of something different. Uh, in, in, in fact, it's almost certainly made of something different because uh, otherwise we'd, have, we, we'd be able to study it more, more, uh, more easily. But this picture of the building blocks of the universe we only have only arrived at because of the success of quantum mechanics similarly in chemistry here's a, a 
picture of a, a modern periodic table. I say modern because I'm not quite sure if you can see my cu uh, cursor, but um, the, the the line, uh, uh, the the bottom of the large, uh, the, the the main body uh, of the table ends in the in the far right with OG element 118, Oganism. Um, these are uh, the, all the, the the elements that make up all all matter. Um, when it was when the, the uh, this table was first put together by Mendeleev in the 19th century, of course, he only knew about roughly half of of these elements. The point is, we now understand why this periodic table has the structure that it does, how the elements are classified and arranged in this way according to their their chemical and physical properties. It's because of quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics gives us the rules that says how electrons arrange themselves around atoms and the way the electrons are arranged in orbitals gives us the, the different elements and different chemical structures. So physicists and chemists have used quantum mechanics for a century and, and we know how successful it is in describing our world. And yet it's strange. This is my uh, favorite cartoon depicting the weirdness of the quantum world. Here's the quantum skier. Uh, you can see he's, he seems to, I mean, the, the, the tree looks intact. He, there's no reason to think he couldn't father children, uh, right? And yet somehow his skis have gone both ways around that, both sides of that tree. Uh, clearly something, you know, there's, there's trickery involved here. But this is essentially what we see happening in the quantum world. Particles moving in, 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 in two directions at once, being in two places at once, in communicating with each other across distances, tunneling through um, energy barriers that they have no right to be able to, to, to travel through, like a ghost going through a wall. And yet those counterintuitive properties are part of the you know, everyday quantum world. Biologists, on the other hand, have got away relatively scot-free in not having to worry about quantum mechanics. Um, in part, this is because of the tremendous success of molecular biology and genetics, which are fields that grew pretty much the, the, the same time as, as physicists were developing quantum mechanics in the first part of the 20th century. And yet, the molecules of life are made of atoms, and we know atoms are quantum mechanical. These balls and sticks models that, uh, that depict, uh, you know, the, the, the different, each colored ball is an atom. So the, the black balls are here depict, depict carbon atoms, the white balls are hydrogen, the red and the blue are oxygen and nitrogen and so on. These days, of course, uh, uh, molecular biologists and, and, and biochemists uh, will use computer models to describe uh, uh, large molecules. This is a large, um, uh, an enzyme made up of maybe uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of atoms or, you know, vibrating with, and their chemical bonds holding them together. The point about this is that there's no quantum mechanics here. These are sort of billiard balls. You know, the atoms are described as classical objects bonded to each other via these chemical bonds. There's a bit of quantum just coming into the, the, the various energies that they have. But by and large, there's nowhere here where you can see quantum tunneling or quantum superposition, these, these sort of counterintuitive ideas. And the question is why? If we imagine quantum physics, for example, is the, uh, the base level of reality, uh, then quantum physics and the rules of quantum physics would explain organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is about atoms bonded together. Organic chemistry scaled up in complexity gives us molecular biology. Molecular biology is life. Now, here's the first warning. You might, I, I hope you are wondering, hang on a minute, um, just because life is made of atoms doesn't mean life is quantum mechanical. After all, everything is made of atoms. Why should life be any more quantum mechanical than anything, than anything else? Good question. That's not what quantum biology is. Of course, if you dig down deep enough in any structure, whether it's living or inanimate, if you get small enough, you will hit the quantum realm and you'll start seeing particles behaving in, in a, in a quantum-y way. Quantum biology is a field that says there's something different about the atomic structure, molecular structure inside living organisms, where quantum mechanics may be being utilized in a way that you don't see in inanimate matter of the same, same equivalent complexity. 
That's controversial. It's controversial as a field anyway, because physicists don't like to get, apart from biophysicists, of course, who are brave, most physicists don't like getting involved in biology because biology is messy and it's complicated and it's hard. Physics is so easy in comparison with biology. It's one equation, explains everything. So physicists would much rather study, the, if they're going to study the quantum world, they'd much rather do it in their carefully controlled laboratory environments near absolute zero, in, in a vacuum, shielded from the outside world. And even then, seeing you know, these uh, delicate quantum uh, behaviors uh, is something that's really hard to, to, to capture. So physicists shy away from quantum biology. Biologists are not so keen because, by and large, they haven't studied quantum mechanics. You know, they can't do the maths. And a lot of quantum mechanics is about maths. The chemists who sit in the middle between physicists and biologists say, what's all the fuss about? Of course, everything, you know, all biology ultimately is chemistry and chemistry ultimately is quantum mechanics. Don't go inventing new areas of research. You know, this, 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 there's nothing exciting here. So you can see whatever area of science people come from, there tends to be a good deal of uh, skepticism towards this field. Nevertheless, I hope to persuade you that, uh, that there's something interesting and non-trivial going on here. Um, what does quantum biology require? Well, it's, it's that, that, that term, non-trivial quantum phenomena. So what's a tr what, trivial quantum phenomena simply means everything's made of atoms and atoms stick together in a way that requires certain sort of quantum rules. Non-trivial quantum phenomena are things like what we call quantum coherence, uh, particles behaving like waves, in, those waves interfere with each other. Um, superposition, again, a property of wave-like behavior that we, we discovered back in, you know, 100 years ago, that particles can, 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 can uh, behave like spread out waves. Quantum tunneling is, is uh, uh, this, the notion that a particle can travel through an energy barrier, even though it doesn't have, it's like kicking a ball up a hill, but not kicking it hard enough to get the top and over to the other side. If that were a quantum ball and a quantum hill, you could kick it halfway up the hill, and there's a non-zero chance it will disappear and reappear on the other side. Almost like magic. It would be magic to us if we saw it in our everyday world, but it happens all the time in the quantum world. It's not, this is not speculation. And, you know, we know quantum tunneling happens. Without it, the sun wouldn't shine, for example. Quantum entanglement is another notion that, uh, in fact, so strange that even Einstein was unhappy about it. He famously called it spooky action and, and couldn't really accept it. And yet we know that quantum entanglement happens all the time down in the subatomic world. So we're looking for these sorts of phenomena, these sorts of mechanisms inside living cells. And more importantly, that they somehow play a functional role in life, that life wouldn't be able to exist without a helping hand from, from this, the, these sorts of phenomena. Okay, I want to go through a bit of history. I, so I, I, I want to talk maybe it's like for another half an hour and say so I've got the technical stuff to, to come. So I, I hope I don't rush through too much. Um, there were two reasons for interest in quantum biology, actually from the very start, from when quantum mechanics first appeared on the scene. Uh, First, first of all, quantum mechanics was so successful in physics and biology that these quantum physicists, the pioneers, you know, Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and Werner Heisenberg, they arrogantly believed that um, they've solved all the problems with physics, they've solved, therefore, all the problems in chemistry, and maybe those biologists down the road might want a helping hand as well. Um, uh, and so there was an interest in this idea that, that whether quantum mechanics plays a role in, in living systems. The other less obvious one is, is the rise of a movement called organicism. So at the time, there were these two schools of thought. There was the reductionists who believe that everything is basically the sum of its parts. Any complicated system, whether it's living or not, you could understand its properties by breaking it up into its, uh, into its constituents. On the other hand, well, certainly when it comes to trying to understand life, there was this so almost sort of spiritual attitude called vitalism, suggesting there was a spark of life, something other, something beyond physics and chemistry that would 
um, describe life, something very, very special that we haven't understood. In between was this notion of organicism, um, which says that there is something mysterious about life. There is something different that separates life from non-life. Uh, but it should be something that's explainable by the laws of physics and chemistry, either new laws of physics and chemistry or existing ones that we haven't really uh, uh, applied correctly uh, to understand life. Um, one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, of course, was the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, and he inspired a lot of uh, uh, his young disciples, as it were, to, to venture into the then equally exciting field of molecular biology, people like Max Delbruck, Pascal Jordan. Uh, he gave a famous lecture in uh, the late 20s. So, so here's an example of Niels Bohr's very um, obscure way of, of speaking and writing. Uh, brilliant though he was, he wasn't the, the most clear uh, uh, in explaining what he was thinking. So before I conclude, it would be natural at such a joint meeting of natural scientists, this was at a, at a, at a conference, uh, to touch upon the question as to what light can be thrown upon the problems regarding living organisms by the latest developments of our knowledge of atomic phenomena, by which he means quantum mechanics, which I've hereby described. So he's basically saying, can we learn something about the nature of life from this new theory that we're developing called quantum mechanics? One of the people inspired by him was this German physicist, Pascal Jordan. Uh, he uh, published a famous paper with another German uh, physicist, Max Born, in the mid-20s, not quite as famous as the part two of this research, where they were joined by one of the greatest geniuses in 20th century physics, maybe of all time, Werner Heisenberg. So together with Max Born and Werner Heisenberg, Pascal Jordan developed essentially the mathematics of quantum mechanics. I'm saying this because I want to, I'm, I'm building up Pascal Jordan as one of these great pioneers of quantum mechanics. He was also someone who got interested in trying to apply quantum mechanics to biology. He was convinced there were some ideas in quantum mechanics, something called quantum indeterminism, the notion of the fuzziness and, and uh, the uncertainty and probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics that would explain some of the processes of life. So essentially, you know, he, he would arguably wrote the first paper on quantum biology in 1932, quantum mechanics and the fundamental problems of biology and psychology. However, there was a problem with Pascal Jordan because he was a Nazi. And I don't mean uh, that, you know, to sort of keep your head down during 1930s Germany and not speak out. Oh no, he was a fully paid up fascist. <laughs> and so after the war, um, of course, he was completely discredited. And with him, to some extent, went the whole field of quantum biology. It was tarnished by the fact that it was championed by a Nazi. Not that quantum biology as a field itself had anything to be, to be ashamed of. It's not like, you know, eugenics, for example. There was one other physicist, however, who kept the flame uh, a, a, a light, and that was Erwin Schrödinger. He famously wrote a book called What is Life in, in the mid-40s. Um, it, it's, it's such a famous book that, you know, people like um, Crick and Watson were inspired by it when they uh, um, figured out the double helix structure of DNA and so on. Schrödinger made the point that he said, living organisms seem to be a macroscopic system, so a large system, which in part of its behavior approaches purely mechanical in contrast to thermodynamical behavior uh, to which all systems tend. What he was basically saying is that if you take inanimate matter, certain materials, and you cool them down to near absolute zero, zero degrees Kelvin, minus 273 Celsius, you calm down all the thermodynamic jittering, all the vibrations, uh, of the, the atoms and molecules of that material. And everything is slowed down to the extent that the delicate quantum behavior can kick in. And Schrodinger said the structure, the order inside a living cell is reminiscent of inanimate matter of equivalent complexity near absolute zero, where you see quantum effects kicking in. So is the structure, the order of living systems somehow have something to do 
with quantum mechanics. It was hand wavy. There was no sort of uh, there was no equations, no experiments, no no real scientific evidence that what he was saying was true. But it was uh, it was speculative, and because he was Erwin Schrödinger, uh, sort of people listened to him. But this is the point, you know. Living systems, us say human beings, in a way we are like a steam engine in the sense that we are systems that take in energy, what we call uh, uh, low entropy energy, energy that allows us to do work. We convert that energy into, in our case, chemical energy that allows us to function and live and metabolize and so on and move. In the case of a steam engine, it's taking in coal, chemical energy, burning it, turning it into motion. Um, but are we more than steam engines? Are we able, is life somehow able to reach down through the thermodynamic uh, chaos and randomness down to the structure and the ordered uh, laws of quantum mechanics? That's the question. Well, I got interested in, in, in the subject uh, probably about 25 years ago, only because it was fascinating. I didn't give up the day job. Uh, and um, and I worked with my colleague at Surrey, John Joe McFadden, who's a molecular biologist. And it was, you know, we'd, you know, over a beer or a coffee, we'd, we'd wonder about some of these phenomena that in, in biology that might require quantum mechanics. But then in 2011, uh, Phil Ball, the science writer, wrote an article in Nature where he, he talked about the dawn of quantum biology. He, st he collected together the then growing evidence, experimental evidence, as well as theoretical models that seemed to hint that there was something going on. It was at that point that uh, John Joe and I started to get more serious about the subject. Um, there were examples of organisms uh, 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 and uh, creatures that seemed to, for example, make use of quantum effects in navigation. They were, uh, uh, um, as well as um, birds and marine and mammals, even insects, seemed to have a sense uh, uh, that, that they were able to sense the Earth's magnetic field, which is very, very strange, you know, because the Earth's magnetic field is, is, is weak. How could it possibly affect the chemistry inside organi uh, organisms? This was one of the examples that got people interested thinking, you know, is there something quantum going on here? Most famously, it was the European robin. Um, the, this uh, husband and wife uh, uh, couple of ornithologists, the Vilchkos, uh, published a, a, a very famous paper in the mid-1970s where they showed that the European robin, so this is not like the, the, the British robin, which is sedentary, it's, it remains where it is all year round. The European robin that, that spends its um, springs and summers in Scandinavia and Northern Europe migrates every autumn down to the Mediterranean looking for warmer weather. And one of the tricks that it has in uh, uh, navigating, in finding its way uh, while it migrates, is to sense the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. It has some sort of built-in compass. And, and they showed this, you know, that, that, that was without any doubt that it clearly does sense the Earth's magnetic field. There's all sorts of very clever uh, experiments to, to show that, the, uh, that this was really what was happening. What wasn't understood, of course, was how. Where was this compass in, into, uh, built into? Is it in its brain? Is it, you know? Uh, and um, the leading contender to this day, the leading contender explaining this is that this is down to a particular protein in the bird's eyes uh, called cryptochrome, which uh, is light sensitive. It's, you know, light comes into the bird's retina. Uh, and the, the photon, the particle of light, creates what's called a, a, a pair of entangled particles that that uh, behave in a way that is very, very sensitive to the to the direction the bird is orientated in the Earth's magnetic field. So this was one of the uh, examples of, of a, uh, um, a phenomenon in biology that couldn't be explained, but potentially could if we uh, uh, were, were brave enough to, to call upon quantum mechanics. Well, John Joe and I here, here he is, my, my good friend John Joe, uh, 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 who works with me at the University of Surrey, uh, he and I re realised that this, this was a very interesting field, and this is the book that Cleo mentioned in, 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 in the nice introduction, 
um, Life on the Edge, we, we brought together all the different ideas in biology that were hinting at potentially having a quantum effect, starting from things that sort of by this point had become reasonably well established. For example, uh, the action of enzymes, the, the workhorses, those proteins inside living cells that make and break other proteins. Part of the, the one of the tricks in their armory was to move particles around very, very efficiently to catalyze chemical reactions to, to make them they happen faster. And one of the ways they did this it was through this process of quantum tunneling. So enzyme action through quantum tunneling was one. And we walked, we talk about this, this idea of magnetoreception in the European robin, all the way to the, the, the wacky end. And the wacky end of quantum biology is things like, does quantum mechanics explain consciousness? I say wacky, not because I think it's wrong, but I just think we are not ready to explain something as complex as consciousness, just because consciousness is mysterious and quantum mechanics is mysterious doesn't mean the two are connected. Uh, so quantum biology is really more about learning to walk before you can run. Look at individual mechanisms to see if you can explain them. Well, uh, we were also, John, Joe and I were very serious about getting res proper research done at Surrey. So we established this, uh, uh, what's called a doctoral training center at Surrey. We've got a big research grant from a foundation called Leverhulme. Uh, and so this group of, of um, handsome um, people were our first cohort of uh, PhD students. There were chemists, there were biologists, there were physicists, all studying different aspects of, of, of quantum biology uh, at Surrey. And we built Surrey up. I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that Surrey is now one of the world centers of research in, in, in quantum biology. When we first started off, everyone was saying, oh, you know, Jim and John Joe, I think they've gone a bit a bit wacky. I think, uh, yes, it's not quite serious stuff. But now, uh, you know, papers are being published, grants are being dished out and so on. So what sort of things? I've mentioned some of these uh, ideas, candidates for quantum biology. I mentioned enzyme action. That was confirmed decades ago in uh, research labs in the US, in Chicago and, and, and Berkeley. Photosynthesis, the idea that um, the way plants and bacteria capture sunlight and deliver it to the what's called the reaction center in the cell to turn it into chemical energy, one of the stages of that process seems to require quantum behavior. Um, I've said well established here. Actually, there is still controversy. There are still a number of scientists who are arguing that there isn't any quantumness going on in photosynthesis. So that's still an open question, which is great. You know, the nice thing about scientific research is that there are still questions to be asked. It's really boring if we had all the answers. We'd, be, we'd have nothing to do otherwise, would we? Uh, magnetoreception in birds, which I talked about. The nature of smell may have some quantum element to it. Um, and DNA mutations, which is what I really want to focus on uh, for, the, for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes of this talk. Things like connections with cancer, connections with the origin of life, connections with the nature of consciousness, those are far too speculative uh, to really take seriously just yet. Also, the problem is if you start talking about quantum mechanics is going to solve cancer, well, forget the Daily Mail headlines. Um, it's, it's a small step beyond that to, to the really crazy stuff. Quantum mechanics explains telepathy, quantum mechanics explains homeopathy, uh, astrology, and, and whatever other nonsense ology you can think of. So we sort of draw the line under, under 0.5 here if we want to do some serious science. OK, so quantum tunneling in DNA. Um, in 1963, a Swedish uh, physical chemist, Per Olof Lövdin, published a paper where he said there's the possibility that um, particles can quantum tunnel between the two strands of DNA. Uh, it was very interesting work, but again, rather hand wavy. It was speculation. This is something that in recent years we've started to take more seriously, and that's really been the focus of a lot of my research over the last decade or so. So the idea is this. Um, think about the, the double helix, the uh, and DNA, the, the, the two strands that are wound around. It's, it's like a spiral staircase or, or like a ladder that you twist around. Well, the rungs of that ladder are chemical bonds called hydrogen bonds. Uh, so if you zoom in, essentially those hydrogen bonds are holding together certain points within those DNA strands, 
molecules called nucleotides. And there are four types of nucleotides. These are the, uh, the, 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 the alphabet of life, the building blocks of life. There's A, T, G, and C, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine always bonds to thymine in a normal DNA. Guanine bonds to cytosine. And you can see here that the, the uh, between adenine and thymine, these dotted lines, that th these are hydrogen bonds, essentially a hydrogen atom that provides the glue between uh, one atom on, on one molecule on adenine and another atom on thymine, maybe two oxygens or an oxygen and a nitrogen. If you zoom in, uh, this is the, a balls and sticks model. Um, these white balls are the, are the hydrogen bonds. Now, because my background is nuclear physics, for me, when, when I think of a hydrogen bond, I think of a proton, right? The nucleus of a hydrogen atom. I don't care about electrons. Chemists care about electrons, I don't. Uh, for me, that's a proton that is providing the glue holding, uh, holding these, these uh, molecules together. The point is that these two protons can jump across. One goes one way, one goes the other. They, they tend to prefer to sit closer to one side than the other, but they can spontaneously hop across. If one goes to one side, the other goes to the other side. Um, this is what Lerv Dean in that paper in the 1960s talked about. He said, these protons can hop across. The question is, how do they do that? Well, he did a hand wavy argument we the, the very first the serious um, calculations that we did was back in 2015. Uh, so Adam Godbeer was one of my PhD students, and and he used a, um, a mathematical approach called density functional theory. It's like a black box, horrible, very very complicated maths, <laughs> and you do all the complicated maths, and you just see these. Uh, protons are jumping, the white balls jumping from one side to the other. The question is, how likely do, are they able to do this? And do they do it using quantum mechanics? The point is that imagine those white balls have now changed color, it's now a little red ball. Rather than sitting close to one side or another, imagine them as balls in, in a, in a hill-like landscape where it, the ball prefers to sit in one dip but if it had enough energy, it could go up the hill and roll over into the other dip. That will be equivalent to these balls jumping from one of the nucleotides to the other, from one strand of DNA to the other. If it does this, if it's got enough energy, fine, good, so what? There's no quantum mechanics involved here. But there's another alternative. Remember when I first I talked, I said, what is quantum tunneling? It's about a ball rolling halfway up a hill, and then somehow magically quantum tunneling through the energy barrier to the other side. We wanted to figure out how likely this was, uh, this would happen. Okay, so this is where I get a bit technical and I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because I mean, if you're really interested, you can ask me in the Q and A or you, you know, you can, uh, uh, I, I can send my, you know, our, our papers, but basically, Step one is to work out the shape of that um, energy landscape, mapping the energy landscape using this idea called quantum functional theory. And this was work with, that we, we, we published uh, more recently in 2021. Okay, so the graph on the left shows uh, this energy barrier for the protons that bond G to C. So this down on the left-hand side is where the proton would most prefer to live because it's further down. It's, more, it's a more stable place for it. If it has enough energy, could it go up the hill or tunnel through the hill and end up on the other side, in which case it's sitting on the other strand of DNA? The other pair of nucleotides, A and T, has a different energy shape. So it's not so likely that the proton will spend much time on the other side because it's like a plateau. It's not like a dip. It's, you can imagine a ball sitting there can burn, and then just roll back down again. Why is this interesting? I haven't said wh why we might be fascinated by this. The point is, when uh, DNA uh, unzips and the strands separate in the process of replication, if that proton is in the wrong place, or actually both protons are in the wrong place, because if one jumps, the other jumps. 
If the strands unzip with the proton sitting on the wrong side, that will lead to a mutation. So do mutations uh, uh, happen because of this random hopping over uh, of the protons from one side to the other? We know mutations take place for all sorts of reasons, ionizing radiation, just copying errors and mistakes. But you don't you know, mutations are important because without them, there'd be no evolution. But they're not. We don't want too many mutations. We didn't want mutations during the, you know, the COVID pandemic when the virus was uh, uh, mutating. Okay, so mutations are things that are very important that, in, that we need to understand, and we want to know if pro protons take or play a role here. Step two is we use what's called open quantum systems. So this is where my physics stuff comes in. Uh, uh, a quantum system normally. Uh, it's doing what it's doing, behaving in a quantum way and, uh, and minding its own business. But if it's surrounded by an environment, then that quantumness can leak away. Uh, the, the environment essentially is looking, it's measuring, it's, 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 it's uh, disturbing the quantum system. And by doing that, it causes the quantum system to, to leak away its quantumness, like a hot cup of coffee in, 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 a, uh, in a fridge, uh, where, which is leaking away heat, energy. Here, it's leaking away in quantum information. And we wanted to know whether there was something special about the environment inside a living cell that stopped this quantumness from leaking away too quickly. Because if you want quantum mechanics to play a role in, in, in biology, uh, that's unexpected. Quantumness is so uh, delicate that you'd expect within a tiny, tiny fraction of a second inside something warm and messy and complicated and noisy as a living cell, quantum behavior disappears very quickly. We say decoheres. So decoherence happens very quickly. But is there something, in, uh, is there structure inside a living cell that allows decoherence to happen more slowly in order to give quantum mechanics a chance? For example, give that proton a chance to quantum tunnel across. OK, so this is just for the technically minded. I'm, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of the caldera leggett master equation, but that's the equation we use. And it's a very pretty little thing, but, but not, not pretty enough that I want to show you. Lots, lots of Greek letters. OK, what to take from this? And I, and I realize I don't want to go on too. So the only thing I, you need to, to look at here is the graph. Um, so this is a plot of the, what's called tautomeric probability. That's basically what's the probability the proton has got across to the other side to create what's called the tautomeric form of these nucleotides, it, what, what leads to a mutation. So what's the probability? And along the horizontal axis is temperature. So if, as you make something, uh, it starts off like with a thousand degrees. As you cool a system down, if you assume those protons are only hopping over the top and there's no quantum going on, then you would track the red line. And you can see that if it's very, very hot, there's a good chance, one in a thousand, 10 to the minus three, or more than that, um, chance that the proton will be found on, on the wrong side. Why? Because if it's hot, if the environment in the cell is very hot, and of course it's not gonna be a thousand degrees, so that this is much hot, hotter than life, um, that heat energy will knock the proton up over the barrier, right? And as you get cooler and cooler and cooler, the chance that there's, there's less and less energy in the environment to help the, 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 the proton over the barrier to the other side. And it goes all the way down to like, forget it. If it's really cold, uh, nothing's gonna happen. But this dot dash line is at 300 degrees Kelvin, which is the temperature of biology living systems. And the blue line is the chances of the proton getting across via quantum tunneling through the barrier. And you can see quantum tunneling stays remarkably stable. It's, there's a good chance that it could happen even at biological temperatures. There's 10, 10 to the four, so 10,000 times more likely. If the proton's going to get across the other side in a living system at this temperature, is 10,000 times more likely to do it by quantum tunneling than by over the barrier hopping. So that was the first question answered. Quantum mechanics, if it's going to happen, quantum mechanics is much more likely to be the cause of it. But of course, that's what 
that's the likelihood of the proton being found on the wrong side if you were to take a snapshot of DNA, minding its own business inside a living cell. The real question is, what happens when the strands unzip? And so um, th this is a paper published uh, just last year uh, where we asked the question, what happens as the strands enter the, um, uh, an enzyme called the helicase? I think I've got, an, uh, yes, an animation here. So here's your strands of DNA. They're going inside this enzyme. It pulls them in and it unzips them like a, like a, a, a zipper, unfastening and separating them. Deep inside, you've got these nucleotides on each strand with the protons that potentially are jumping across from one side to the other. The question is, as the strands unzip, do we capture the proton on the wrong side? And if we do, that would lead to a mutation. Well, it turns out that actually quantum tunneling is so likely to happen that there, are, there should be many more mutations in biology than we actually see. So something's going on that's actually reducing the level of mutations. So, so it's not that quantum mechanics is, um, uh, 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 you know, does it happen or not? It seems that it happens so much that it would be disastrous if we, if, we, if we allowed it to. And so this is the energy shape. Remember that the, 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 the barrier, the proton uh, in, in GC bonds, um, the, the, the proton Cs, when so DPT here stands for double proton transfer, basically two protons, each one going uh, in opposite directions, and that's the shape of the energy barrier. That's the that's the 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 uh, scenario that we calculated there being a very high chance that you know ten, uh, one in ten thousand chance that the, the 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 proton could quantum tunnel across. That leads to too too many mutations. Too many protons are sitting in the wrong place when the strands are, uh, zip, uh, unzip, that when they replicate themselves, you, you, you end up with a mutation. But when we look at what happens once the strands start to unzip, that shape, that energy barrier shape changes. Um, here, look, it looks flat. What seems to be happening is that there's something causing the... Uh, the likelihood of the proton to get over to change as the strands unzip. And the culprit seems to be this little enzyme called asparagine, N624, which is, the, it's, the, it's the, like the zip fastener, the, the, uh, the thing that un unzips them. It sits at the entrance, it just as they separate, and it changes the shape of the, of the, uh, um, of the energy. Right. I want to, um, um, uh, forgive me as I skip through the next quantum stuff, uh, because I, I think that it'll take too long to talk about. Let me jump to the, to the conclusion here. This is, this is what, what is actually going on. You've got the DNA sitting in an environment with basically water molecules, and that environment can affect how the, these protons behave, how quantum mechanical they behave. You start off with, a, because a proton is a quantum object, it's essentially, you can describe it just like those, the, the eagle-eyed of you will have spotted Schrodinger's cat in the box, the cat being dead and alive at the same time. These protons are really quantum objects. They really exist on, if you describe them correctly, you have to say they exist on both sides of the barrier at the same time. Essentially, the proton's like a smeared out wave, a smeared out uh, a cloud of probability uh, uh, existing on, on both strands of DNA at the same time. Um, the helicase, this is the enzyme that does the unzipping. If you are familiar with Schrodinger's cat's paradox, the cat that's in the box with the poison that uh, is radioactive, so the cat has to be dead and alive at the same time, and only when you open the box do you force the cat to make up its mind, is it dead or alive? Um, well, that's what this helicase is doing. It's equivalent to opening Schrodinger's box. What it does is force the proton, say, look, you can't be on both sides at the same time. Make up your mind. And it says, yep, OK, you're definitely on this side or that side. 
with a crucial difference. At the same time as this helicase is checking where the proton is, it's also changing the likelihood that the proton is going to be move, moving across. So it reduces the number of mutations. It does appear that life has evolved the ability, in some cases, to use quantum mechanics, potentially like the navigating birds uh, using quantum entanglement to find their way, but also evolving to stop quantum mechanics from having such a such a uh, what would be a disastrous consequence so this is the, the conclusion that when it comes to proton tunneling it's not that life knows about quantum mechanics and utilizes it to its advantage it's also possible that life knows about quantum mechanics and has evolved mechanisms to prevent it from potentially damaging life it's not magic right Quant if if life could could uh, find an advantage in utilizing the tricks of the quantum world. It's had three and a half billion years to find what's the most efficient shortcut to make something happen, but also to mitigate against something happening that it doesn't want to happen. That's just evolution. The big question is, which seems, to, and th th this research seems to suggest, that evolution knows about quantum mechanics and has used quantum mechanics and it also has prevented quantum mechanics from having a, a, a detrimental effect. The work, and I, this is my last slide to, uh, uh, for a stop, uh, this is work. So Louis Slocum, he's now a postdoc working with me at the University of Surrey. Max Winoka has just got his PhD. A lot of this work, and the, these pretty graphs that I showed and the animations is, uh, are their, their work. Marco Saki is, is a computational chemist. So this is what's so lovely about this research. I'm a quantum physicist, a theoretical physicist, so I do the equations. Marco is an expert in these big um, uh, computational models to describe these complicated nuclei. Uh, Max and Louis, they both graduated undergraduates with physics degrees. They ended up learning chemistry to study biology. Uh, and that, that's what's so nice about this, this field is that it's truly interdisciplinary. Lots more questions to answer, of course. Uh, but you know, this is this is the first step in 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 a process that's that I think is very exciting. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think I just have to jump in here and recommend uh, your book, Life on the Edge, to everyone. It, the reason I recommend it so highly is because just like today. It, you're listening or reading about something that's way above your head, really, in terms of understanding. And yet I got to the end of his book and could explain uh, to, to some extent, at least, the it was the photosynthesis bit that really grabbed me. And it's like in today you've taken that that concept that I, that I read about and sort of made it harder and, and faster. And it was thank you so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, what kind of questions people are going to ask. Right. Um, so we're going to have a break now for 15 minutes. But first, I want to remind you that next month, we've got Adrienne Hill joining us. She's going to be talking to us about Tourette's syndrome, sounds, movements and myths. Uh, it's not an uncommon condition, but there are very many misconceptions about it. So it'll be good to hear more from an expert. Uh, also, to remind you that when we finish the broadcast, we'll be opening our pub, the Lockins Razor, where you can join us for after talk drinks and nibbles. And you'll find that at sitp.online forward slash pub. So uh, I will we'll see you back in uh, 15 minutes at 10 past eight. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we're going to go straight into the questions because we've got about uh, 20 minutes and I'm going to, first of all, Skeptical Gumby has actually simply said the pet question. So uh, we've explained what that is. And what yes. <laughs> so for me, two cats, two 17 year old brother and sister, uh, both completely deaf but in, otherwise in perfectly good health. They're not with me here in, in, in my study, but uh, just during the break, I had to pop down and, 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 and feed them again. They've had their tea, but they obviously were both expecting more. So uh, anyway, Honey and Charlie. <laughs> I reckon at 17, Honey and Charlie deserve an extra, uh, extra <laughs> Yeah, trick. exactly. We do spoil them. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the next question comes from Andrew Kay, and he asks, um, how have chats on quantum biology gone with philosophers? 
have those promoting panpsychism seen quantum biology as an underlying mechanism for consciousness? The, the philosophers that I work with, and I do work closely with uh, a number of philosophers of physics, um, and, and they are very receptive to the ideas, but more in the sense of the, uh, you know, to what extent does the, 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 the surrounding environment of a quantum system in, in living, you know, some sort of similar sort of questions that I'm interested in. Um, the philosophers more on, on the broader um, um, topics, things like panpsychism, I think it's... Um, they sometimes think they can use quantum biology as an excuse to to justify what they're doing. Uh, people who are serious in quantum biology try and distance themselves from that because, uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it just it just is too close a step to to pseudoscience, and quantum biology isn't meant to be pseudoscience. <laughs> so that actually goes in nicely to Pine Snake, who also who asks a question. That you might have actually answered this question, because uh, he says, "What intentional rep misrepresentation of quantum physics uh, annoys Jim the most?" And he adds, "Is it always Deepak Chopra?" But that's that. Um, <laughs> yeah, mostly, mostly Deepak Chopra winds me up. That's true. I, I suspect it's it's the notion when people talk about quantum entanglement uh, and. And sort of the traditional way, which is not probably the best way, the traditional way of explaining quantum entanglement is two separated particles being somehow still linked because they're just, technically we say they're described as a single quantum state. And so what you do to one affects the other. And, and this is taken sometimes to assume that you can influence things instantaneously, what's called non-locally, at a distance. And so what bugs me most is when people say, ah, oh, well, this explains telepathy. This explains why twins, when they're far apart, and say, oh, yeah, because they're identical twins, one of them felt the pain of the other one. No, no, that's <laughs> not how quantum entanglement works. And, uh, you know, I try, I tend not to get into arguments, for example, on social media, on Twitter, but with things like this, I just feel it necessary to slap people down in a very arrogant, sciencey sort of way. Fair enough. I'm <laughs> sure I cope with that. Well, at the top if they can't. <laughs> and then we've got one of our most prolific question uh, questioners, Igor. He says, do you think we might benefit from squashing all the science fields into one big study of reality discipline so that we stop arguing about the distinction? Uh, so arguing about distinctions is, is, is certainly something we should be ad addressing. But I, I, science is so broad now, even the natural sciences, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, geology and so on, are so broad and there are so many specialist areas that it's impossible to squash it all into one and, and have any sort of uh, a sensible uh, study of, 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 of phenomena. I think we should change uh, the the categories. I I remember write, uh, helping write a report for the Royal Society many years ago, where I argued. Not everyone was keen on it. I said, you know, thirty years from now, kids at school shouldn't be doing physics, chemistry, biology. They should be doing nanoscience, environmental science, and genetics, <laughs> or and robotics or AI. Right. Each of those today is an interdisciplinary area. If you're studying the climate, and the environment, that requires a lot of input. If you're studying um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, the nature of consciousness that requires input from lots of areas. So maybe the categories change rather than merging them all together. Uh, certainly the silo mentality is, is something that we have to we have to address. Like a bit in, in universities, people study sometimes sit I, years and years ago, I, I studied medicine at university, and um, instead of studying physiology where I went, it was brand new in the 70s, you studied systems. So you study, say, the cardiovascular system, you'd study everything about it, pathology, so everything. And you're talking mm. about a similar sort of thing, aren't you? I think that's right, yes. It, it's certainly it, it, a it, really interesting way to learn. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's the way a lot of research is going, um, um, addressing problems that require input from several traditional disciplines. Mm. So um, Igor again asks, uh, what part of consciousness still can't be explained by old, regular, boring ke uh, chemoelectrical processes and are in need of further explanation, like most of it? Uh, well, consciousness is still mysterious. The, 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 the notion of self, the notion of, you know, the, the, uh, the centre of, of me, you know, the self-awareness uh, uh, and, and sentient, sentience, 
is something we, we're learning. You know, there, there are neuroscientists and philosophers and computer scientists. Uh, I, I absolutely can recommend the writing of a very good friend of mine, Anil Seth, mm. uh, uh, talking about nature of consciousness. One of the, the books that influenced me most, actually, in my scientific career was Daniel Dennett's Consciousness Explained. Um, uh, but I think, you know, so we are explaining a lot, but I think there's still a long way to go. It's certainly more than just neuronal activity as as we're discovering trying to build AIs when people say, oh, no, you know, chat GPT. It's it's uh, it's almost artificial general intelligence. It's almost sentient. No, 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 no. no. It's a long, long way from that. So it's still it's still a mystery. Right, and Anil Seth is on my to read list, so I shall, I'll, I'll bump it up. Please do. Right. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Arthur Wolf Rett, who's um, linking more to actually what you spoke about this evening. Um, and they ask, uh, on quantum tunneling, is it that quantum particles live in a 4D universe instead of our 3D one, so they sort of travel along planes we can't see? Um, no, quantum tunneling is, is, uh, can be described and explained in general sort of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. It's more the fact that a, a quantum particle like a proton is not localized in a particular point in space. You know, forget time. Uh, it's actually spread out. It has an influence over a wide volume of space. Uh, and, and so there's a non-zero chance that part of it, what it's called the wave function, part of it will leak through a barrier and will exist on the other side. That isn't where it is. That is really just giving us the probability that were we to look, we would find it there. So the probability is spread out over a large distance, but it doesn't, you don't need um, 4D space time to explain that. I remember in your book reading about um photosynthesis that's how you described it that how it that's how the proton magically appears somewhere it shouldn't be is that right in in photosynthesis it's it's the photon the the lump of light energy uh, and in that case yes it's it's basically following multiple routes simultaneously uh, so it's behaving like a like a wave that is forming an interference pattern and it's that well of course light is a wave anyway so maybe it's not it's not so uh, so mysterious, but in, but in this case, the way that energy package is delivered inside the cell in photosynthesis is as though it's uh, moving in multiple directions at once, and that somehow they come together at the end to to deliver one single photon at the right place. Right. Um... And a more on similar subject, I think, maybe not. Andy Wilson asks, uh, thanks for the talk, Jim. Uh, what are the causes for the breakdown of Newtonian physics in favour of quantum at the borderline? Still a subject that's being studied. Um, you, you, get, you get to the point where things start to get fuzzier. Um, uh, Usually the way we try and understand this borderline is to start from the quantum end and gradually make it more and more classical. How does a quantum system gradually evolve and, and start behaving classically? You you don't get you don't can't arrive at the quantum world starting from the classical end. Right? It just gets smaller and you get smaller and smaller, and it just gets less and less reliable at predicting reality. Uh, so to understand this transition, you have to start from the quantum end and gradually relax the quantumness and gradually things come into classical focus. But how that happens, this is called the, the quantum classical boundary, that, that is still an area of research. We, it's still not something we quite understand. What is it that defines something as classical and something as quantum? The early pioneers of quantum mechanics drew a sharp divide. People like Niels Bohr uh, came up with what we now call the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, where they said there's the quantum world, and there's us classical objects uh, observing it, and they they just they just left it at that, rather than saying, well, what's what's you know how does one transition into the other? That's that's a big question. Right. So um, it's, it's back back down at the small level again. Nick G. Uh, hi, Nick. Asks, uh, have there been any studies or conversations around the influence of quantum mechanics in abiogenesis? Um. A bit. 
uh, a little bit. So, so the origin of life, right? So, um, in fact, we have a um, a grant proposal that I'm putting in. Marco Saki, who's who I showed at the end, my last slide, my my collaborator, chemist, and another collaborator of mine, uh, Andrea Rocco, uh, both both Italians, by the way. I, I seem to be collaborating a lot with Italians, both based at Surrey. Um, we're putting a grant proposal together to look at quantum mechanisms and abiogenesis. Um, you know, what is it that turns chemistry into biology? Mm. Uh, it's a big <laughs> origin of life is one of another, you know, along with consciousness, and one of the big mysteries in science. And so it's a valid question. Does has quantum mechanics played a role in 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 helping make that transition? from something that's just complicated but, but, but just pure chemistry to something that can make copies of itself, uh, that can maintain a state far from equilibrium. It's, and it's, actually, it's going to be looking into that. Yes, yeah, so there, there's, there's a, there was a, a, a paper that came out of, uh, last year on something called assembly theory, which is a, 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 a way of quantifying uh, levels of complexity. How complicated does something have to become in order, you know, a chemical, for example, to become before it's so complex that it can make a copy of itself, that you can call it biology. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're thinking of, in my mind, that uh, I want to develop this new field called quantum assembly theory. Don't tell anyone, right, because it's like, it's, it's my, my big idea. Well, actually, it's not. It's Marco Saki's big idea, but I, I keep telling him it's 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 a really clever idea, and we can get research funding for it. He's he's a rather more sceptical that uh, people can see through. <laughs> Realise we just want it. We just want grant money, but actually, but yeah, it is. It's, it's, it is still a mystery whether quantum mechanics has allowed um, uh, the, the 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 building blocks that would become the building blocks of life to somehow sort through and arrange themselves uh, uh, in a way that finally ends up being a living, uh, uh, a simple living um, organism. Um, did quantum mechanics give it an advantage because it allowed all possible permutations to coexist at once and then the right one gets picked out of the quantum superposition? Uh, that's 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 the, the general idea. Do you ever want to have 50 lifetimes so you can go back and study oh, all the different stuff over I, and over? I know, yes. And, you know, as, as you get older, you realise, ah, shit, time's running out. I need to yeah. know this stuff. Because <laughs> I'll never have time to know, to know enough to even begin to understand what he's, what I know. he's doing. Yeah. But, yeah. Very frustrating. <laughs> um, another one from Igor who asks, uh, do you think determinism is correct or are quantum magics bringing randomness into the system? Um. Yeah, this is not a straightforward question. You know, we do we live in a deterministic universe? Yes, I guess things are deterministic, but certainly even at the quantum level, it's not agreed yet whether reality is deterministic or not. Because some interpretations of quantum mechanics say the quantum world is inherently indeterministic pure randomness you know something happens that you could ne that could never be predicted there are other interpretations the uh, everetti and many worlds interpretation bohmian mechanics and so on which are um deterministic uh, uh, and so th whether that the you know the whole future is predetermined is still something we we're not sure about we can't d determine it that's 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 for sure but whether it is already preordained but we just can't figure it out is a different matter Right. Um, there's another, I think it's a really interesting question from Gray the Earthling. And uh, they ask, uh, why do we think that the Robin's internal compasses are quantum, not just plain old floaty magne magnety metal? Um, because people have tested that. They, um, they thought it was, um, yeah, magnetic uh, crystals that could align themselves alongside the, 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 the uh, optical nerves, for example. Uh, uh, that that could, if they're affected by the Earth's magnetic field, then they would somehow influence the optical nerve or Im influence the, the way the signalings go to the brain in a way that tells the bird to go this way or that way. Um, but they didn't seem to stack up to um, experimental evidence. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just that 
that is doesn't seem to be the the, the theory favoured by people working in this field. Now, quantum entanglement to explain avian navigation, it's sort of like you want it to be true. It's just it would be so cool if this quantum effect that Einstein called spooky action at a distance is actually helping the European robin find its way down to the Mediterranean. It's it, it's it's just beautiful. That's not how we do science, unfortunately. So it may turn out just because you want it to be true doesn't make it so. Uh, so it's still an open question. OK, another another one that we need another lifetime for. Possibly. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so that brings us on to our um, final question, uh, which Pine Snake asks, and he wonders which your favourite sci-fi series is. Very limited on options. Star Trek, Star Wars, please answer Stargate. But let's open it up. Ah, uh, well, yeah. So because of my my age, I would prefer Star Trek to Star Wars. I mean, maybe that's not obvious that because of my age. No, Star Trek, I will hold over Star Wars. Um, but when I say Star Trek, I, I do mean the original Star Trek. Um, you know, the 1960s and 70s. That's why I grew up with as a kid watching on TV. I mean, yeah, you look back now and it's an awful um, special effects and so on. But that, for me, that was 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 magical. Um, and uh, I remember giving lectures probably 20 odd years ago uh, to undergraduate students. And, and I said, I'm going to explain relativity theory uh, using an example from Star Trek from the original Star Trek. And one of the students said, oh, the original Star Trek? You mean the, with, the, with the captain with the bald head? <laughs> so that's not the original, because this is before the new franchise of the, you know, uh, with Chris Pine. Is it Chris Pine? Yes, you know, who yeah, plays Captain Kirk. Yeah. Uh, before that all came out. So I said, no, the original Star Trek. <laughs> William Shatner, you know. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> embarrassing. Yeah, Rewatching them, um, yeah, they're not nearly as good as the later ones. No, you, you but wonder why. My, but... my preteen crush on Chekhov, I think, is um, not <laughs> never quite gone away. <laughs> but yes, but in, in terms of um, series, actually, the the, the sci-fi series that I've, I've enjoyed most in recent years has been The Expanse. Um, as on is on Netflix or Prime, I can't remember now. <laughs> but that's I like hard sci-fi. I like hard sci-fi, you know. Although I, I I enjoy fantasy, I I prefer hard sci-fi near future. Uh, Star Trek, I suppose, is hard sci-fi, isn't it? But um, yeah, The Expanse was was something that I really felt. And I, I know I, I I started reading the books, then I I reverted to the TV series and, and saw it through to the end. Yeah, I, so that's a, another recommendation for The Expanse, which is brilliant, and the film. And I'll finish up with a book recommendation then for, for uh, um, Sunfall, which uh, another, another hard sci-fi book, go out and read it. That, so that was I, good fun in writing. <laughs> so can I thank you very much indeed for a really fascinating talk, and uh, do go out and, and buy Jim's books. And join us next week to learn more about Tourette's syndrome. And uh, once again, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thanks, everyone.